I did not see him straightway. Had I looked, I could not have seen. Better to catch a glance from the sides, better to listen, better to release the brain from the bedrock of what we all know. It is his function to seduce the imagination. It is his function to illuminate the borders of Republican and plotting Middletown. Though social, the creature is more animal. He wears no clothes and moves in spurts. Mostly, he remains still, holding the axis, waiting for the opening that will come. When Steve dropped the bottle cap, I laughed, told Steve I'd been waiting for that, told him about this being, about the yarn I was threading from his space. Oh, that's got to be Bob Nichols, Patsy told us, and her weekly client under the brush. He is the fellow who changed the house into the salon that Steve bought. It was so strange that he died two weeks before it opened. It's got to be his ghost. We are at Shapes and Hair Design, 2209 Central Avenue, Middletown, Ohio, almost downtown. There are mirrors in front of the chairs and around the corner a kitchen cupboard with an entry from the backyard, now a parking lot. There also is a door that opens to a stairway. It descends to the basement, washer, dryer, and Steve's private keg of beer. It could be that Bob Nichols remains in that place, but Bob is not what I know. It wouldn't be Bob to live in a kitchen. Unlike Patsy, I'm not a good Christian. I sense the mischief of an angel and nimble spirit. Long before Bob, the forest came down. That's when my little beast adopted the house. There he remains among the cones and dyes in the sensuous blue beauty salon. He remains true to his place, waiting with great patience in what was the kitchen. He keeps things cooking. I smell it. He is there, dancing the edges of imagination. This can see him. He is gray, like the squirrels in the yard, for a brown at the tips. He is as quick as they and unpredictable, his skin shabby soft, limbs long and foldable as a bat's, and his fingers with nails, not claws, wait for opportunity. It does not matter that all would deny his existence. He lives not for recognition or for others to believe in him. It is his living to exist solely for the pleasure of hearing the sound of a falling cone hitting the hollow floor. We are growing goldfinches. It is March, March, and we, unlike the birds, are not immune to the clock. Still sleepy from spring forward, I watch. Gray bodies on gray mornings, now subdued. Still, they are my goldies. All winter hanging, they eat seed from the upside down feeder. Most glorious in August and September, I watch them from our deck. It is the best time to see the finches come. You hear them first, that pulsating chirp which reflects the rise and dip of flight. Their frantic babies trill to be fed, fluttering earnestly on a canvas, green, yellow, and gold. They come clothed in their yellow vest, a suit worn only by the changeable male. They are such lovely little acrobats, flighty as Chinese emperors, 
Some say they are the wild canary. Around here, that is what they are, always outside, never caged. Delicately, they savage the giant sunflower. So tenderly, they hold petal and stem with nimble and crazy feet.